Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. I'm Pastor Tuck, and welcome to the Word at My Church. If this is your first time joining us, we want you to know you're in exactly the right place. You're exactly where God wants you to be. So I want to encourage you to share this broadcast with at least three people, because as believers, we have a mandate to spread the gospel of Christ all over the world. We are a teaching ministry with a mission to help people get better by teaching them how the Word works. So go ahead and get your Bible, your notebook, your pen, your highlighter, and let's get ready to dig into God's Word. But before we do, let's begin with our Bible confession. So go ahead and grab your Bible in your hand and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I believe every word. I am who it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. By hearing its word and applying it by faith, it'll change my life. So I declare right now, from this day forward, that my life will never, ever, ever be the same again. And neither shall the life of anyone with whom I share this word. So I declare, I'm going to share this word with someone so that their life may be changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Precious God, Lord, we thank you today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these moments of preaching. Father God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for every opportunity. Father God, Lord, to approach your throne of grace. Father, we thank you, Lord. Father God, Lord, for choosing me, Lord, as a vessel. Father God, Lord, to speak to your people. Father God, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, to move me aside. Take my place. Speak for me. Speak through me. Father God, Lord, that they would not hear me, but Lord, they would hear you. Father God, Lord, download, Lord, insight, foresight, and revelation directly from heaven. Father God, Lord, that we may be, Lord, and do all that you have called us to be and do. Father God, Lord, speak to us like never before. Father God, Lord, pour out into us. Father God, Lord, that we may, Lord, reach our full potential and be, Lord, all that you've called us to be. Father God, Lord, that we may be your change agents. Father God, Lord, that we may impact. Father God, Lord, the earth like never before. Father God, Lord, that we may, Lord, reproduce and become, Father God, Lord, the things, Lord, that you desire. Father God, Lord, that you desire us to be in the body of Christ. Father God, Lord, that we may be the leaders in the fields, Lord, in our homes. Father God, Lord, in every field of endeavor, Father God, Lord, that you have placed us in those spheres of influence. Father God, Lord, that when people would cross our paths, Father God, Lord, you would have a word in us, Lord, that would impact their lives. And Father God, Lord, we thank you, Father God, Lord, for those areas, Father God, Lord, that you're taking us higher in. Father God, Lord, where you're stretching us. Father God, Lord, where you're making us, Lord, be better. Father God, to do better. Father God, Lord, that others' lives, Father God, would Im be impacted to the level that they would know you as their Lord and Savior. And Father, we thank you for that today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our trust in you and your Son. Father God, Lord, for that work, Lord, that you did on Calvary. And we thank you, Lord, for it all. And we ask you now, Father God, Lord, that we would walk in that boldness, Father God, Lord, and we bind the contrary spirit, every demonic force, anything that would attempt to hinder, Father God, us going forth, any technical demon, Father God, anything, Lord, that would, would hinder our ministry, Father God, from doing what you call us to do in the earth, and we thank you, Lord, for that assignment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise God today. Amen. And if you've been with us, then you know we've been talking about the year of progression, because God said that 2022 would be a year of uncommon favor and accelerated harvest, harvest. And that as covenant believers, our progress will have no limits. But if we expect to experience divine progress, we've got to get better understanding of who we are and who God is. Because the scripture declares that the people who do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And it's not just about us. Like Nick Fury said in the original Avengers movie, there was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people so that when we needed them, they could fight the battles we never could. See, the Bible says the world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So they're looking for someone to show them who God is. And I told you we are the ones because as the church, the ecclesia, we've been called out to be different. So, you know, in the war against the rulers of the darkness of this age, God has chosen us to be his agents of change in the earth. And there is no plan B. 
As a matter of fact, he himself tells us in Psalm 82 to defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted, deliver the poor and the needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. He goes on to say, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. And then he says to us, you are God's. All of you are children of the Most High. See, as born-again believers, we are the children of God, which means we are no longer just flesh. We are now spiritual people, divinely supernatural, those who have the ability to operate above the laws of this world and beyond the limits of our flesh. As a matter of fact, John tells us in his gospel, as Jesus is, so are we in this world, which means while Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the father, ruling over the heavens, we're supposed to be ruling over the earth. Oh, somebody type in the comments. We are gods in an earth suit. In other words, we are real life superheroes. And that's why the enemy hopes we never figure out who we really are. That's why he battles so hard to keep you in this identity crisis, trying to get you to identify with just this flesh suit that you wear to keep you in this place of low self-esteem, this place of doubt, this place of insecurity, this place of frustration, this place of rebellion. Because see, when God deposited his DNA on the inside of us, it did not diminish our God nature. And it's our super secret identity as the righteousness of God that gives us access to all the power and authority of heaven. But even though we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, the kryptonite of guilt and condemnation often render us powerless by causing us to doubt what God said about us. And that's what keeps us in that place of inconsistency. Because the Bible says the man who doubts is unstable in all of his ways. And that's why it's important that we understand this superpower of grace and how to access it. Because grace is simply what God has already done. It's the divine enablement that gives us the ability to do everything that we could not do before. And when we rely on his grace, instead of our own ability, our life should look like the life of a superhero. Our life should appear effortless. And the key to living that life is playing our position. I told you on last time, in the act of salvation, there is a savior and there's one who gets saved. There is one person who does the giving and the other who receives what has been done. And it all depends on your position. But so that there would be no confusion as it pertains to his will in regards to this matter, God tells us in his word to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Oh, did y'all hear what I just said? He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Somebody type in the comments, we're not the ones who are supposed to be sweating. Yes, yeah, see, because when you stand still, you're not supposed to be exerting any effort, any energy. You're supposed to be in a place of rest. See, and that's why God made that clear. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He said, in other words, stand still and watch me work. Oh, y'all better catch me. He says, because Jesus already did the heavy lifting. But the reason why so many of us continue to struggle is because we've allowed the enemy to convince us that we're on our own and that there is no hope in sight. And that's why God had to remind us on last week that we are not without hope. As a matter of fact, open your Bibles with me once again to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And when you get there, look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. And here it reads, We are hard-pressed 
on every side, yet not crushed. Yeah, see, we may be under pressure, but see, pressure may bust pipes, but it also makes diamonds. And see, we're not in the pipe category. See, we are hard pressed, but we're not crushed. He said, we're perplexed, but not in the despair. See, we may be perplexed. We may be a little confused. See, but we, we don't get despaired by that because the Bible says if a man lacks wisdom, all he have to do is ask of God. See, even though we may get to a point where we're dealing with a little confusion, we may, uh, may be some things we may not be, uns we may be unsure about, but we have the source of all knowledge on speed dial. So we don't have to fall into a place of desperation. He says, persecuted, but not forsaken. See, yeah, they may be coming for you, but you don't have to worry about it because you're not on your own. He says, struck down, but not destroyed. I think Donnie McClurkin said it best. We fall down, but we get up. See, you, 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 may, you may be able to knock us down, but you can't count us out. Oh, he says, always carrying around about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. See, even though we're still subject to the same problems, the same issues as the rest of the world, we have something they don't have. Because as believers, we have access to God's grace, the finished work of Christ. And we carry on the inside of us the very power of his resurrection. Oh, let me tell you that again. See, even though we're still subject to the same powers, the same problems, the same issues as the rest of the world, we have something that they don't have. Because as believers, we have access to the grace of God, the finished work of Christ, and we carry on the inside of us the very power of his resurrection. Paul puts it this way. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, it's all about the finished work of Christ. As a matter of fact, go over to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And when you get there, look at verse 33. John chapter 16, beginning at verse 33. I'm reading this from the Amplified Version of the Bible. And here he reads, I have told you these things so that in me, we know in the Bible says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he says, I've told you these things so that in me or in my word, you may have peace. He says, so that you can may find peace, confidence that you can be at rest. So he says, perfect peace and confidence. So you can find perfect peace and confidence in my word, in the promises that I made you. He said, because in the world, you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. See, even though our lives should appear effortless, that doesn't mean we won't have problems. As a matter of fact, Jesus even tells us that we would experience frustrating situations. But here he makes it clear that no matter how bad the situation may appear, we should be unfazed by it because it cannot hurt us because he has already handled it for us. Somebody type in the comments. He's already taking care of it. Oh, can I prove it to you? Turn over to Colossians chapter two. 
Colossians chapter 2. See, because I know some of you thinking, well, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. But I'm dealing with something right now. But see, you've got to know what the word says. You've got to believe in the finished work of Christ. You've got to believe in his grace. You've got to believe in what God has already done. See, because, watch this, what he's already done is more real than what you're actually experiencing. I know somebody said, I don't know what you're saying, Pastor. See, what you've got to realize is that if you look at the end of your Bible, God knows the end from the beginning. So see, what we're doing is actually walking out, trying to get to the end. But God's already been there. So what he has already done, you're trying to walk into what God has already done. Oh, I, I, I pray somebody just caught that. What he's already done already exists. You're just walking into the manifestation of what he's already done. So what you're dealing with right now, God's already taking care of it. I'm going to prove it to you. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Amplified Bible. Here he says, God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it, the cross. It says God disarmed the principalities and powers ranged against us. He says, so basically he pulled the teeth of the lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. That were actually coming to eat us. And then he made a bold display of them and public example of them. He actually taxidermed them and hung them on the wall. Showing victory over them. And he did that in Christ. And in the cross. See, when they thought they were crucifying Christ, they were actually hanging themselves. See, that was literally the case of him giving them enough rope to hang themselves. The Bible says if they had known who he was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So every trial, Every frustration, every distressing situation that comes to harass us has been deprived of its ability to harm us because Jesus has already given us the victory over them on the cross. See, that's why he said it's finished. Well, if that's the case, Pastor, then why is it that when situations occur, do we as believers still struggle? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Because as believers, we're not supposed to struggle sometimes and not as others. We should be like DJ Khaled. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. Yeah. All we do is win, win, and win. And all of our victories should be effortless. Because John tells us in his first epistle that the victory that has overcome the world is our faith. And if the just, those who've been made righteous, shall live by faith, and the victory that overcomes the world is faith, then our life should be a life of victory. So all we should do is win. So if we're not experiencing constant victory, it must be a faith issue. Go over to Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. 
Watch this. I, I was watching, uh, I was online the other day, and I, I came across a video by one of the generals of the faith, uh, Bishop Ivy Hilliard. And he was talking about a time in his ministry when he said he was struggling, going through some things, and he was, uh, he was stressed, he said, because he was believing God that they were going to be able to make payroll for the ministry, and they were going to be able to take it all up that particular Sunday. He said, and it didn't happen. He said, so that Monday, he called his pastor. And he calls him and he goes, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, uh, how am I going to tell my leaders that I can't pay them? And his pastor said, today, Monday. And you've already counted God out. Pay ain't until Friday. And he said it was at that moment, he said, you don't have to say nothing else. He said because at that moment, he realized that he was not in faith. That his faith was in himself. See, because he had already made up in his mind how God was going to work. And because God didn't work the way he thought he was going to work. Then he didn't think God was going to work. See, so many times we think we operate in faith and we're not even in faith. See, so if we're not winning, it's a faith issue. And it's never God. It's always on our end. Oh, I think somebody needed to hear that today. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 1. Here it says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. See, there is a promise of entering his rest. Remember, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me, in my word, you may have perfect peace. See, we ought to find perfect peace, confidence, courage, rest in his word. See, if we can find a word on it, we ought to be done with it. I don't care what we see. I don't care what we feel. I don't care what their body says. I don't care what we think. The word should settle it all. If not, it's not faith. Because faith is simply the acronym for all I trust him. And you can't say you trust him if you're doubting his word. Because, see, doubting his word is the source of instability. Remember, I told you, James said, the man who doubts is unstable in all his ways. And, see, that's why our life is always up, down, left, right, all over the place. That's why we're not constantly winning. He said, in me, in my word, you may have perfect peace. He said, we didn't have to worry about tribulations, trials, frustrations, or distress because he had already handled it. He had already secured the victory. He promised us we could rest in him, in his word. He said, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. He said, since there is a promise, remains of entering his rest. He says, since I've made you a promise that you could come to a place where you could rest in my promises, that you could totally rely on what I said. He says, since I told you in my word that you could totally rely on whatever I say, he said, then you ought to fear. Lest any of you seem to come short of it. He says, since there is that promise, you got to be careful that you don't miss out on that. That we don't settle for anything less than what he said we could have. See, you ought to make every effort to make sure that you're not living beneath the place that my trust is totally based on his word. He said, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, 
not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. I need you to catch this. What he's literally saying, it has happened before. He said other people throughout the scriptures have received the promise of constant victory. The promise that they could totally rely on God's word, that they had the ability to rest in him. And it didn't benefit them. He said they missed it because they didn't put their trust in what he had done for them. Watch this. Remember when God brought the children of Israel to the land of Canaan? To the promised land? He promised to give them a land for which they did not labor. He said they would dwell in cities that they did not build. That they would live in houses that they did not fill. That they would drink from wells that they did not dig. They would eat from vineyards they did not plant. But when they arrived, they sent spies into the land who returned with the evil report saying that there are giants in the land. And the land eats, devours the people. He said, and we look like grasshoppers in their sight. See, that's because their focus was on their ability instead of God's ability. What they couldn't do instead of what God had already done. See, they were not focused on the fact that God had already brought them out of slavery, made their captors give them all of their stuff, that he had carried them for 40 years, through the wilderness, and their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, they never missed a meal, they never went thirsty. He kept them alive for 40 years and then brought them to a place where everything was already provided, didn't nobody try to kill them, and he get there, and now they're talking about, oh, God brought us out here, and now, and now these people going to get us. See, that's why the enemy will always try to present you with situations that appear overwhelming to get you to focus on what you can't do instead of what God's already done. See, it's a battle for your faith. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Or oh, I pray I'm blessing somebody this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And when you get there, look at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6. See, if you're not operating in faith, you can't be a witness to nobody else. And see, that's one of my, one of my pet peeves are fearful Christians because you can't operate in faith and in fear. Fear and faith operate in the opposite polarity. They cannot occupy the same space. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. That word eternal is zoe. So in other words, lay hold of zoe life or the God kind of life. He says, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. See, that zoe life or that God kind of life is a life that pleases God. It's one where we have everything we need, but we have it by trusting in what he's done instead of our ability. Here, Paul tells us in order to possess the God kind of life, we have to fight the good fight of faith. Well, I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, the only good fight is the fight you win. And God gave me some revelation on this. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And when you get there, look at verse 7. Now we just saw in 1 Timothy, Paul tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Look at what he says here in 2 Timothy. He says, I have fought the good fight. He says, he has fought the good fight. Well, if that's the case, then he must have won. Well, how did he win? He says, I have finished the race. He has completed his assignment. See, the reason most of us quit is because we've allowed the enemy to convince us that our situation is hopeless. To shift our focus on what we couldn't do 
instead of what God has already done. He says, I have kept the faith. He kept his trust in God's grace instead of his ability. See, when we talk about what we can't do, the reality of this world becomes greater than the reality of our God. And a shift in our thinking is required. Because if God can only do what we have the ability and resources to do, then what we've done is created a God in our own image. And he is no different than an idol. Oh, I believe y'all just missed what I said. If your God can only do what you have the ability and resources to do, then what you've done is created a God in your own image, and he is no different than an idol. What do you mean, Pastor? If the reason that you have trouble believing God is because of what you see in your bank account, is because of your educational level, is because of your background, then you're not trusting God, you're still trusting in you. And see, you've created an image of God, a God in your own image. And that's what we call an idol. But let me help you. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Here Paul says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, our responsibility is to develop, is to develop a kingdom mindset. To renew our mind. Because the enemy will do everything he can to keep us thinking like the world does. See, that's why the world has an issue with believing in God, because they can't see anything beyond themselves. See, when you start talking about doing something that is beyond human ability, beyond human com comprehension, that's why the world has trouble accepting God. The Bible says the flesh man, cannot receive the things of the spirit because they are foolishness to him. See, because it goes beyond the flesh realm, he, cannot, he thinks it's foolish. But see, we are not flesh. Remember, we are spiritual people, divinely supernatural, those who have the ability to live beyond the limits of our flesh, above the laws of this world. So you got to remember that we are gods. We're just like our father. So we understand because we have the spirit of God living on the inside of us, reminding us of who we are. So we can't put the limits of the world on our God. Stop trying to confine the God that's in you and start living and trusting the spirit that lives on the inside of you. You've got to rest knowing that when he tells you, I got this, then you got to trust the fact that he's got it. See, I told you the enemy will do everything he can to keep us thinking like the world. And if we don't have faith in what he's already done, we will constantly be questioning what he will do. What do you mean, Pastor? Go over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 11. He says, not that I speak in regards to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That word content means to be satisfied, self-sufficient, possessing enough to need no help. Verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. He says, I I've learned how to live when I'm on a lower level. He says, and I've learned how to live when I'm living the high life. He says, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
The New International Version says it this way. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, regardless regardless of whether I'm broke or whether I'm rolling in it. My faith is not in my ability or my resources. My faith is always in him. See, the problem is most of us have learned to have, have not learned how to live blessed. See, when we're in lack, it's easy for us to understand that we need God's strength. But when things are going good, we forget that's when we need it even more. And that's why we need to possess the mind of, that Jesus had. See, we can't allow blessings to conform our mind into something God didn't transform it into. What do you mean, Pastor? You know, we sowed seed and believed God. But now that we've gotten to a place where we have received a harvest, where we have what we believe God for, we don't need him anymore. That makes no sense to me. But that's because we don't know how to handle blessing. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And when you get there, look at verse 12. He says, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when, you, when your herds and flocks multiply and have silver and gold are multiplied and all that you have are multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from your house of bondage. And then you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that me establish your covenant, which he swore to your fathers as of this day. See, watch this. This scripture is so timely because we see this all the time. People, when they're broke, when they're struggling, always praying, God, I need, you to, I need you to provide for me. Lord, I just need to pay my rent. Lord, I need to pay my cell phone bill. Lord, I, I, I need something to eat. Lord, I, 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 I just need, Lord, I just need, I need money for my weed, Lord. Oh, don't trip. Oh, you know how, y'all know how we do. Oh, Lord, I, I need, Lord, I just need, I need, Lord. Lord, if you just get me through this one. But then we get through. We get the degree. We get, we, we get the promotion. We get the job. We get the house. We get the cars. We get clothes. We get everything we want. And now all of a sudden, we busy. Sunday mornings, we ain't got time for the word. We ain't got time to go to church. We washing cars on Sunday. We cutting grass. We got, we got everything else in the world to do. We don't have time for God anymore. God forbid somebody tell you, oh, you ought to sow a seed. You ought to give an offering. You ought to do something to show God how thankful you are because God did everything. And, oh, and that's when we really get arrogant. See, because see, we've built these beautiful houses and now we dwell in them because we got house, we got cars, you know, we got plenty of money in the bank, you know, because see, oh, we have a good time now. We, we vacationing, we trips, we got everything we need because poverty and lack are so far from us. And somebody even try to tell you it's only because of God. Oh, well, I, I work for all this. I, I, I did this. But he said, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. And he gave it to you that you may establish his covenant.
He gave it to you for the purpose of establishing his covenant. Everything God does for you, he does for kingdom purpose. And see, the fight of faith is to get you to put your trust in your ability instead of God's ability. And the enemy will try to convince you that your situation is too difficult to handle. So you begin to focus on what you can't do instead of what God's done for you. And if that won't work, he'll make you comfortable. So that you think you're doing things by your own hands and you don't need God. But the key to constant victory, the way to always win, is putting your faith not in your ability or inability because it's not about what you can or cannot do, but what he has done. It's all about his grace. See, when we trust and rely on the superpower of his grace, it produces an anointing that guarantees us victory and enables us to live above the issues of this world. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, the Bible says you have an anointing from the Holy One. Go over to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. And when you get there, look at verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10, beginning at verse 27. Here it reads, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The Amplified Bible reads a little differently. It says, and it shall be in that day that the burden of the Assyrian." shall depart from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck. The yoke shall be destroyed because of fatness, which prevents it from going around your neck. Now let me read that again, but this time from the New International Version because it, it gives more clarity. He says, in that day, the burden will be lifted from their shoulders, from your shoulders. Their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. Here, what the prophet is saying to us is that when we put our trust in what God has done, God will progress us to the point where we have gained so much weight that it literally destroys the yoke and it will no longer fit. Oh, let me help y'all see this. See, a yoke is a tool of control or bondage that you put around the neck of an animal or a slave to limit where they can, con can go or what they can do. And can you imagine trying to put the collar that you, that you use for a chihuahua on a rottweiler. Yeah. It won't fit. So when he talks about us getting fat, he, he means that we have progressed, that we have grown, that we have increased in anointing to the point where the yoke of bondage no longer fits, where what used to be acceptable is no longer acceptable. See, when we trust and rely on God's grace instead of our own ability, we'll progress to the point where the yokes that cause us to fail will be destroyed because we've grown so fat 
and it will prevent them from going back around our necks. It will destroy the yoke of fear. It will destroy the yoke of doubt. It will destroy the yoke of lack. It will destroy the yoke of insecurity. It will destroy the yoke of failure so that all we do is win. See, the next level of anointing that we will walk in will deliver us from some stuff. The stuff that keeps us in bondage. Stuff that was too tight for us. Stuff that didn't fit us properly anyhow. See, some of us don't fit in the projects. And when we begin to trust in God's word, more and more, when we trust in what God did for us, more than we do our job or our education, we'll become too fat for project living. See, some of us don't fit in abusive relationships. But when we begin to take in so much word and begin to put our faith in what God has done, we'll become so fat that we will no longer fit. We'll become too fat for abusive relationships. See, we'll become too anointed for the stuff that the enemy keeps trying to use to make us fail. We'll realize that we were meant for nothing but winning. But we've got to tap into that superpower of grace. See, it is like the Hulk. Y'all remember when the Hulk used to get angry. Those gamma rays used to course through his veins. And he would Hulk out. His shirt would rip. His pants would rip. See, the clothes that used to fit him wouldn't fit no more. See, he couldn't put them clothes back on because that's why he always was walking around with capris, shorts, and no shirt because once he hulked out, once the anointing fell, that shirt no longer fit. See, because once that superpower of grace falls on you, once you start putting your trust in that finished work of Christ, in what he has done for you, that anointing will cause you to hulk out to the point that the anointing will make your neck so fat, the yoke of bondage will no longer fit and the enemy will no longer be able to keep you there. I told you we're the ones and the world's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. They're waiting to see us, the church, hulk out. They're waiting to see somebody break these chains. But you got to put your faith in what God has done. You've got to get to that point where you're resting in what God's word says. See, because the problem is Every time the enemy shows you something, you turn back into Bruce Banner. And he says, yep, it'll fit. But if I trust in God's word, then that anointing never leaves. It produces an anointing that will give me constant victory. I will stay in that constant state where I have the size, the strength to overpower anything that the enemy brings. God bless you today. I pray this word bless you. But you've got to trust in the finished work of Christ. Because remember, even though problems show up, he's already handled it for you. You're anointed for this. 
If you're listening to me today, you're like, man, this sounds powerful. Wish my life was like that. Well, guess what? It's not hard. Because it's not about anything that you do. It's about what Jesus has already done. And so all you have to do is accept what he's already done on your behalf. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you desire that today, all you have to do is accept the offer. The Bible says that if you would pray, believe that Jesus died for you. He said, whoever believe that Jesus died for you. And if you're willing to make him your Lord and your Savior, give him permission to make your every decision, then you could be saved. That's all that's required. See, salvation is free, but it comes with a cost. And the cost is your life. See, you can't have the life God has for you and keep living the life that you're currently living. That was an exchange made. You got to be willing to make that exchange. So pray this prayer with me. Precious God, come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus died for me. And I submit my life to you. I want Jesus to be my Lord. I give him permission to make my every decision. Live in me, live through me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to live for you. Be my father. Make me your child. If you've prayed that prayer, you're now a part of the body of Christ, the family of believers, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop you. The next step in your journey is to find a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. And if you desire that, and you desire to be a part of our ministry, just follow the instructions on the screen. Go to our website at www.lovemychurch.org. Click Contact Us. Fill out a connection card. Let us know you received Christ today. And one of our ministers will get back to you with your next steps. We broadcast every Sunday morning at 1215. Every Thursday evening, we have our small groups. Every first and third Thursday, Pastor Stephanie teaches our women's small group in a private Facebook group called Women of Worth. And she teaches our women how to be virtual women, virtuous women according to the scriptures. She deals with women's issues and just gives you a woman's perspective on the faith. Every second and fourth Thursday at 730, me and my spiritual son, Corey Coleman, we, we do a group called The Man Cave, where we talk to men from a man's perspective, help you become better husbands, better fathers, better brothers, better sons. And you want to join that group. Like I said, that's a private Facebook group just for men where we can keep it real and help you grow and be the man that you're supposed to be. And then every fifth Thursday, Pastor Stephanie and I do what we call marriage seer training on our marriage seer training page for those who want godly relationships and godly marriage. And so if you want any of those contact points, you just go to our website. Every Sunday, we do a private Zoom Bible study for all of our partners. And we have all of that information available. All you have to do is fill out a connection card. Let us know. We'll get that information to you. Secondly, if you've been blessed by this ministry and you want to help us continue to do what God's called us to do, click the donate button. Sow a financial seed. You can use cash app, dollar sign, my church Lynchburg, paypal.me forward slash my church Lynchburg, or you can use the Givelify app. But however you desire to give, just know that your gifts are going to help us continue to spread the gospel of Christ all over the world. We're going to be good stewards over your tithe, your offering, your seed. Because our, our mandate is to make sure that the gospel of Christ, the teaching of God's word, is available everywhere. And so we're on just about every streaming platform there is. We're, we're expanding our platforms daily. And that costs money. And so if you want to help support us in our ministry doing just that, we would love to receive your gifts and to help us continue to spread the gospel to make sure that people are getting the word that they need. Thirdly, if you know somebody who needs this word, you think this word will be a blessing to, like, share, tag. Make sure you help us spread the gospel. Make sure you let somebody else know where they can get in touch with this word, how they can tap into the word at my church. 
But in any event, we love you. God bless you. Make sure you come back and see us again. And please stay tuned for our announcements. I'm Pastor Tuck with the word at my church. God bless you. We love you. And see you again on next time. Join Pastor Stephanie for Women of Worth every first and third Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. Join Pastor Tuck in the Man Cave every second and fourth Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. Before the pandemic, our relationship was already in trouble. It's like we argue about everything. I mean, he comes home and he sits in the driveway, in the car, instead of coming into the house with me and his son. See, she doesn't trust me. And she talks about me to her girlfriends. Like she speaks so loudly like she wants me to hear. What am I supposed to do with that? Why do you have to get out of the bed at 11.20 at night to return a text? You see? She doesn't even know how to talk to me. And he refuses to talk to me. Like the first couple weeks of quarantine, together in the house all day and all night, just confirmed it's me. I can't do this anymore. You know what? I'm done. I think I'm done. Maybe we need to get some help. I think we need to talk to somebody. Marriages are under attack. And if you or someone you know needs help, then join Pastors Lewis and Stephanie Tucker for My Church Marriage Seer Training. Every fifth Thursday at 7.30 p.m., Pastors Lewis and Stephanie Tucker have designed a course to help your marriage to not just survive, but to thrive. Get the tools necessary for a successful biblical marriage. You can enjoy this course live on Roku, Fire Stick, and Apple TV via the BoxCast channel or on Facebook and YouTube Live. Just search My Church Lynchburg. Why not make an investment into your marriage that will impact generations? My Church Lynchburg Marriage Seer Training every fifth Thursday at 7.30 p.m. You can now watch the My Church broadcast on your Roku and Amazon Fire TV and Apple TV. Simply download the BoxCast channel and look for the My Church icon. Or catch the word on the go with the word at My Church Podcast. Now available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music. Tune in iHeart's Radio, Pandora, and Stitcher Podcast platforms. Just search for My Church Lynchburg. Now there's no excuse to go without the word. 
And for those of you with Alexa enabled devices, simply enable the My Church Lynchburg skill in the Alexa app. Then say, Alexa, open My Church Lynchburg and sit back and enjoy the word.